Thank you. Jason, why don't you go ahead and take us forward? <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our December webinar, Evaluation and Research in the AT Program. I'm Jason Burkhart. I'll be your moderator for today. Uh, with me here at Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo, Michigan, is Lori Wingate, Director of Evaluate. Also joining us today is Kirk Nestis. Kirk is the CEO of Heasel Associates, an evaluation, research, and planning firm located in Syracuse, New York. Kirk has served as an evaluator on several ATE grants and has been a contributor to our newsletter. Also joining us is Will Tyson. Will is an associate professor of sociology at my alma mater, University of South Florida. He's also a principal investigator at PathTech, a collaboration with Tampa Bay area schools and businesses to improve pathways into AS degree programs and to the local workforce. We'd also today like to acknowledge the behind the scenes contributions of Mike Lisecki and Janet Pinhorn at Maytech Networks and also Emma Perk here at Evaluate. This webinar has been developed specifically for individuals involved in NSF's ATE program. For those of you who are not familiar with that program, ATE stands for Advanced Technological Education. It's focused on improving technician education mainly through two-year colleges, but most of what we'll be discussing today is applicable to well beyond the ATE program. The slides from today's webinar are available on our website. This webinar is being recorded and we'll email you the link for the recording when it's available, which commonly takes about one to two days. We have additional resources on our site related to today's topic as well. As a side note, if you do view a recording of the webinar, you won't see the chat box conversations. This webinar is presented through Blackboard and, it's, um, and we'd like to check in if you've ever used Blackboard before. So please raise your hands if you have used the Blackboard system before. Okay, good. So we see that uh, a number of you have and some haven't. So for those of you that are new to the webinar system, this is a screenshot of what you should see on the far left of your screen. Notice the hand icon here. To raise your hand, just click that icon. Just below the hand raise button is the participants box. This box lists everyone who is attending this webinar. During the webinar, you'll have the opportunity to type questions and comments that you would like the presenters to address. We will be having three main sections, each dealing with a different objective. After each section, we will take a short question and answer break, so we'll address those questions at that time. You can type your questions at any time, and I'll be keeping track of those during the individual presenters' portions, and we'll address those during the breaks. So let's practice using that chat box now. In the chat box, type the name of your organization and how many people are in the room with you today. Looks like, I, like we got people from all over the country and uh, a number of people in the room, so great. Perfect, thank you. Also, as Mike mentioned earlier, throughout the webinar, we'll be conducting a few polls uh, as a part of our interactivity. When we do do a poll, we will ask you to answer by selecting a letter from the drop-down just above the participants box. That will record it and we can display the results. Please don't use the chat box to record uh, poll answers. So let's practice one. Select the response that best describes you or your team. I've not had, I have or have had an AT targeted research grant. My AT project or center grant has a research component. I am interested in pursuing research in AT or none of the above. So go ahead and select the letter that best corresponds from the box above the participants window. We'll just give a second for everybody to click through that. Okay, it does seem like there are some folks that are typing in the window, but please make sure that you use the uh, drop down box. So to show you why, if we could display the results of the poll, that would be great. So for the ones that were selected in the drop down menu, this gives us just a little idea of the distribution. Um, and we see that it looks like most of our respondents came from either an AT project or center grant that has a research component or none of the above. Okay, great, thanks everyone. 
So it looks like we're pretty well oriented to the, to the Blackboard platform. So we'll talk about the objectives. In this webinar, Lori Wingate is going to talk about the basic organization and content of the common guidelines for research or education research and development. Kirk will tell us how to distinguish between evaluation and research, and Will will help us to understand the need and opportunities for ATE targeted research. Remember, you can type your comments or questions in the chat box at any time and we'll go over them at the break. So right now I'd like to turn things over to Lori Wingate, who will talk about the common <coughs> guidelines for education, research, and evaluation. Thank you, Lori. Thanks, Jason, and welcome, everybody. Um, as Jason mentioned, in the first part of this webinar, I'm going to provide an orientation to the common guidelines for education, research, and evaluation. That should not say evaluation. That should say development. Sorry about that. So this is a photo from the session on research and evaluation at this year's ATEPI conference. And I'm curious if any of, any of the webinar participants were at this session. So you all know how to raise your hand. So just give a hand raise if you happen to be at this session at the PI conference. OK, great, a few people. Well, as you can see, it was pretty much standing room only, and there was a fairly vigorous discussion around the implications of these guidelines for the ATE program. As you can see here, uh, Kirk and Will and I were all there as well. And here at the podium is Edith Gummer, formerly of NSF. She gave a presentation on these guidelines, and she was actually involved in the development of the guidelines. So if you're interested in, her, in what she had to say, I would um, suggest that you check out her slides. And we have the URL here on the slide as well as on, on our website for you to check out at your convenience. So these guidelines are the product of a joint effort by the Institute of Education Sciences at the U.S. Department of Education and the National Science Foundation. They were released in August 2013. From what I can tell, it seems like they're just now coming into focus within the ATE program. So I'm curious what your prior knowledge of the guidelines is. So here's another poll to find out about that. And now we know you all know how to use your poll buttons. Um, so just select the response. Uh, A through E here that best represents your experience in the guidelines and remind you again to use the drop down um, selections instead of the chat box here. And if you have additional comments about your experience with them, you can of course use the chat box to, to share those as well. So I'll give you a second to do that. Okay, it looks like we have quite a few answers already, so maybe Mike could present the results for us. Okay, so a fair number has read them, and some have just heard of them. Okay. Well, I'm hoping I can get you oriented to them. And uh, it, it took me a few readings for, for it to soak in, so maybe I can jumpstart that process for you. The main content of the guidelines is a classification of six main types of research and an explanation of the two agencies' shared expectations for these kinds of research with regard to the purpose, the justification, the evidence, as well as external feedback. I want to note here, these are not new merit review criteria. Proposals are still going to go through the same NSF review process with those criteria regarding intellectual merit and broader impacts that probably most of you are already quite familiar with. So these guidelines do not replace those criteria. So here's a bird's eye view of the six main types of research as outlined in the guidelines. It's basically a progression from foundational research that produces new knowledge um, all the way through scale-up research, which is, involves testing interventions that are implemented in diverse locations with diverse populations. And the next set of slides, I'm going to go into what each of these entail. And what you'll see are the definitions that are pretty much verbatim from from the guidelines. Type 1 is foundational research. This is essentially about advancing fundamental knowledge, advancing the frontiers of education, um, making, building our knowledge base and understanding around teaching and learning. Type 2 is exploratory research. This is about investigating approaches to solving problems. This type of research will build on established knowledge and look at factors that may influence education outcomes. It's going to provide those building blocks for developing an intervention. But at this point, we're figuring out what can be influenced, not how 
to create full-blown programs. This level of research is really focused on setting the stage for larger scale R&D work, particularly design and development projects as, or efficacy studies. And we'll get to efficacy studies after we first take a look at design and development research. This is type three. It's pretty straightforward. These types of projects are about developing or improving interventions that are intended to bring about specific changes, specific improvements in education. And here you're designing new or improved interventions, you're designing and developing, but also looking for what the guidelines call evidence of promise. And we'll talk about that a bit later. So evidence of promise that the intervention will have the intended desirable, desirable impacts. And the key feature of design and development projects are that you're going to be modifying the intervention as you develop and test it. It's, it's a very iterative process. Type four is efficacy research. This is when you're testing an intervention under what they call optimal or ideal conditions. That means there are going to be a, there's going to be a lot of support for the intervention and those implementing it, the intervention that's being researched, and they may have more. Those implementing may have more training that we'd see under typical conditions. Um, the population being um, affected may be more homogenous than we'd see in normal under under normal conditions. And the interventions developer is going to be very involved in implementing the program. And um, so we're really setting it up for success. And conducting research under these, these kind of optimal conditions enables the research to determine if the intervention works under the best of circumstances. If it doesn't, it won't have much of a chance of success under less controlled conditions. If it does show positive results at this stage, then we have a justification for taking it to the next level and trying it out under more typical and perhaps challenging conditions. So that brings us to effectiveness research. This is type five, which like efficacy involves testing a fully developed intervention, but this time we're testing it under conditions of routine practice. Basically that means that the implementation, uh, the intervention is going to look the same as, as, if, as it would if we weren't conducting the research. And, and along those lines, there will be minimal involvement by the interventions developer at this point in terms of implementing the intervention. Finally, we have type six. And I'll just take back one more to make sure you can read that. Um, like effectiveness, scale up research is testing the intervention under typical conditions. But here, the difference is that it's implemented in diverse settings with diverse populations. So the question is, is the intervention robust enough to be effective in a variety of contexts and potentially challenging implementation conditions? So those are the six main types of research as they are described in the guidelines. But I feel like those definitions are pretty abstract and kind of hard to wrap your head around, at least for me. So I thought we could think about it in the context of a real world problem that maybe we can investigate via research within the ATE program. And one thing that all these types of studies have in common is that they must be focused on important problems or issues in education. As you'll see in a bit when we get into the justifications required for these studies, there's a clear expectation that the topic being studied will have significant implications for practice and policy in education. There are a lot of challenges. We all know this. There's tons of challenges in our current education system. So for me, I was thinking it might help to bring it down to kind of a personal level. So you all signed up for this webinar because you have an interest in research, in evaluation, or STEM, or all three. So what issues, and I'm inviting you to use the chat box now, what issues are you personally curious about? What problems do you think you might be able to contribute solving with others? Do you, are you noticing any gaps in our knowledge about what works in education or in technician education specifically or two-year college education specifically? So you know, what's sort of driving your curiosity that might take you to uh, a research project that could be conducted under the auspices of the National Science Foundation or the Department of Ed? I'd like to see your, your interests in the chat box. Thank you, Amanda, for stepping up. 
Amanda is interested in re researching STEM literacy. Excellent. I know there are other great ideas out there. I would love to see what you're interested in. And if you see somebody who's also interested, there's an opportunity to create a, maybe a relationship moving forward. Hi, Arlen. Arlen's interested in survey strategies used by AT evaluators. Patricia is looking interested in student recruitment and success through undergraduate research in the community college. That is a hot topic, research, student research, and the impact on, on the student experience. Great. So you guys can watch those as, as those come through. So I'm sure you're going to see a lot of great um, and really important things that could be pursued through research. I'm going to give an example um, to kind of ground this explanation of these types of research. This is a common concern throughout ATE that women are severely underrepresented in ATE disciplines. We seem to be doing kind of okay with, uh, with under, typically underrepresented minorities, but women are still lagging in terms of their representation in this program. And we actually have some empirical data on this. Um, this chart, which is based on the data we've collected, um, from ATE grantees last year. It shows a percentage of students in ATE programs by discipline area. Um, so we can see only in biotech, basically, do we have a proportion of women that roughly reflects that of the U.S. population. So I want to use this issue as, a, as our example as we think through what research at each of the six levels might look like. Uh, I just want to note here the examples I'm going to share were kind of inspired by this report I read by the American Association of University Women called Why So Few. So I've provided a, a bit.ly link here if you would like to read more on that on your own. So here's our starting topic, and I thought we'd just look at, at some examples um, of how this could be approached. Um, if we were going to conduct foundational research related to this issue, we could look at the factors that enhance or hinder girls' interest in STEM. And prior research has shown that a potential but maybe underexplored factor is girls' perception of STEM as less socially beneficial than other fields. Um, our, so our research at this level, maybe we would contribute to fundamental knowledge um, by investigating that issue. Uh, and that's really a key difference here with foundational research compared with the other types. It's about advancing knowledge and understanding. We're not necessarily focused here on coming up with solutions to problems. In our exploratory study, we could build on what we learned from our foundational research, as well as um, work conducted by others, to determine maybe the critical junctures for, for different types of interventions aimed at maintaining female student interest in STEM. You know, if we were interested in building an intervention to promote STEM careers as socially beneficial to society, we would want to know when in a girl's educational career would be the optimal time for that sort of intervention. Um, with research at this stage, again, we're building on our knowledge of what impacts girls' interest in STEM, as well as investigating when the, the best opportunities to maximize factors that attract girls to STEM and, may, and minimize at the same time the factors that deter them. Now we know that having female STEM role models and mentors is helpful for attracting and keeping female students in STEM. So we could focus our research at the design and development level on creating a mentoring program, utilizing those female mentors, but also picking the, those mentors whose work also embodies the socially beneficial aspects of STEM. Um, and doing that to, to in, with the intent of increasing female enrollment in STEM courses in high school, advanced STEM courses. Uh, so here we'd be drawing on what we learned both in our foundational and exploratory research and, and moving forward. So if we did that um, design and development research and found this approach has promise, we could go ahead and conduct an efficacy study to try out our fully developed mentoring program with minority females at just one urban high school. And we would provide intensive training and support to those mentors, really set up the conditions for success as best we can. And as the researchers, we'd be pretty involved in that first real implementation of the program. And if we get positive results, we could test the intervention under more typical conditions. Maybe we would extend it to all female students at three high schools, but still within a contained region, one intermediate school district. And we provide a more typical level of training and support to the mentors. Again, at these levels of research, we're looking at the impact. And finally, we could really put this approach to test by examining its impact in 
when implemented in diverse settings. So in this example, um, we're implementing the program and studying its impact statewide, and that would include a mix of rural and suburban and urban high schools. And again, the level of support to the mentors or those implementing wouldn't be any more or less than that for a standard implementation if research were not being conducted. So one thing I'd like to call out here is that these three types of impact studies all call for treatment and comparison groups. And the guidelines reveal a strong preference for random assignment. It kind of runs throughout the document. So what kind of study we can pursue depends on the degree to which we have evidence to justify the research at a particular level. Now earlier you offered a lot of different um, examples of topics you're interested in or, and are worthy of pursuing via research. So just on your own now, I invite you to reflect on the extent to which you feel you have a theoretical and empirical justification um, for pursuing that topic via a federally funded research project. Because that will dictate your point of entry into this progression of types of research as defined in the guidelines document. This is really about being able to justify the research at a particular level. Types four through six, um, this is efficacy through scale up, are all referred to as impact studies in the guidelines document. And again, the only real difference is among them is really the conditions under which they're implemented and the, the populations that they're involving. Which brings us to the common guidelines for the justification um, expected for each type of study. In the guidelines, there are two dimensions to justification for research. It's policy and practical significance and the theoretical and empirical basis for the research. This just boils down basically to explaining why the topic matters and how we know it matters. And then the next few slides, I'll compare the expectations across the different research types. Research at any of these levels must address important issues in education and have significant implications for policy and practice. So it isn't just about advancing knowledge for the sake of knowledge itself. It's about advancing both knowledge and practice in ways that are actually going to or have a good likelihood of improving our education systems and society. For design and development studies and beyond, um, they're looking for studies that are innovative, which, you know, no surprise, basically means it has to be new. But you can set up a research project to test an established approach if it's being used in a new context or if it's being subject to a level of testing that it hasn't been um, subjected to before. Because effectiveness and scale-up studies are um, studying interventions and strategies in real-world contexts, uh, there has to be good evidence that they're likely to have a positive impact. Um, this helps justify the level of investment required to carry out these studies as well as any burden or risk that may be placed on those involved in the research. So the second dimension of justification is the theoretical and empirical basis for the research. And basically this is the evidence for why a research topic is important and should be studied in the way that's being proposed. So not surprisingly, all of these types of studies have to have a strong grounding in both theory and data. And when you get to design and development research, uh, it's mandatory that a, a sound theory of action be spelled out that explains how and why the proposed intervention will bring about the desired results. And this can be conveyed, for example, through a logic model. For any of the types of impact studies, um, you have to have empirical evidence. It's just not enough to show you have a really great idea. You have to be able to back it up with hard data, which means either demonstrating that the intervention you want to study is widely used but un untested, um, or for effectiveness and scale up, providing evidence from prior rigorous research. So we're talking about more than just pilot data here. So you should be able to see from this, this graphic that the expectations for conveying the theoretical and empirical basis for the research increase as you get to the higher levels. So that's the justification, which brings us to evidence. This is about the quality of evidence produced by the studies. Um, but also the project's intended research outcomes and research plan, which boils down to what the project will produce and how the inquiry will be conducted. 
And like with the justification guidelines, I distilled the key elements here, but there's, this is really quite dense and technical, and it would take a lot more time to go through it thoroughly. So I encourage you to read the guidelines on your own. And what I'm going to do here is to, and this is on the slides if you want to actually look at it in detail, but what it boils down to is that foundational early stage and design and development projects are expected to generate evidence of promise while impact studies uh, are, should generate evidence of impact. And they actually don't define what evidence of promise is. I surmise that it means evidence that doesn't meet those thresholds required for impact studies. For example, maybe it's more cor correlational kinds of findings. And then the evidence of impact, in contrast, is quite clearly spelled out. Um, it means data demonstrating positive results from studies with random assignment and low attrition. And they actually refer to the What Works Clearinghouse guidelines for even more detail of what counts as good evidence here. And the final component of the guidelines are the agency's expectations for external feedback. And unlike the other types, uh, other components of the guidelines, they're exactly the same for all the kinds of research. And they basically offer these uh, options for external review. Um, and only two of them, external review panels or advisory boards and third party evaluator, are actually contracted and coordinated by the funded project. That's pretty different than what we're used to in the ATE program, and Kirk's going to be addressing that issue in his section. So I'm about to wrap, wrap up my section, but I want to highlight two resources I created to help you ease into these new guidelines. Um, the guidelines document is 53 pages. It's quite long and dense. So if you haven't read it full and you want to tiptoe in rather than dive in, here's a, an o, a graphic overview, which kind of is like what I just presented earlier, the more graphic slides. And then a checklist, which is just distills all the key points in the checklist, but it's more of an itemized list. Uh, it might make it a little bit easier to digest. So I just want to close out with another photo. This was a follow-up discussion um, at the PI conference about uh, it was at a breakfast roundtable about research and evaluation, and it was a great discussion. And maybe some of you on this webinar were there, but I think it just sort of to me symbolizes an opportunity for us to pursue this issue more um, and think about and, and work on how it applies to the ATE program. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jason now for your questions. Okay. Thank you, Lori. Um, so we'll go ahead and take our first Q&A break. It looks like there were a couple of questions that were um, entered here uh, in the chat box, so we'll go through those. Uh, but first, I wanted to make sure we, I, we, you were asked the question, do you have to complete each type of research in the order that's presented in the guidelines? Um, no, and I appreciate you bringing that up. The guidelines actually are careful to point out that research doesn't always progress in such a linear fashion. Um, they note that even impact studies could prompt um, foundational research, or really anything could maybe open up opportunities for other kinds of research, and it doesn't necessarily go from type 1 through type 6 in that order. They actually give the example of um, massive online open courses, MOOCs, as something that grew so fast and so big, and there was so much data, it didn't need that foundational and design and development research because it, it was already happening and the data were already out there on a wide scale. Um, with any kind of a typology, I think it's much tidier in theory than the way act, things actually play out in reality. So that's a reason I would encourage folks to actually read the document so you can see those nuances in the content. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, Max Imus asks, uh, grounding in theoretical basis is fine, of course, but can there be a category of exploratory research where perhaps the theory or practical side might not be so clear? Um, you know, I don't know if I can answer that. I know actually for the foundational research, they explicitly say you do not have to show a direct link to student outcomes for that kind of foundational research. I'd have to look back at the, at the next two levels to, to be for sure. But, you know, it isn't a cut and dried thing. So I think it's all a matter of can you make a very strong case that the research is warranted. Um, it's, not a, it's not black and white. And, it, you know, of course, as those who have been on review panels and had proposals reviews, a lot depends on how things are received by those panel reviewers as well. Sure. Thank you. Uh, based on what I'm hearing, it seems that there's a strong preference for quantitative research. Briefly, is that true? 
Well, that's kind of how I feel as well. There is a, a, some mention in the guidelines about qualitative studies and what you would need to do for qualitative studies, but it's fairly limited. Um, so it does sort of read that way, but I'd be hesitant to say, yeah, they're only going to value quantitative studies. Um, it's, it's a complicated issue, and there is not a lot on, on how qualitative research fits in here. But on the, that note, Will, who's going to present later in the webinar, has a very, doing some very qualitative research that was funded by the ATE program at NSF. So it all depends. That's probably the answer to everything. <laughs> Okay. Briefly, we have two more questions and then we'll um, need to proceed. Uh, what background should a PI look for in selecting people to serve on an advisory panel for a research project? That's probably not a short answer necessarily. <laughs> well, I'll give a short answer and then maybe when it's a time after Will's presentation, he could pick up on that as well. I, I think with most advisory panels, you want to have a mix of expertise. You definitely want to have somebody with those strong research skills and experience. Um, but also balancing that with, with content uh, knowledge, subject matter knowledge. And I would vote for having someone who has the sort of field practical experience as well to make sure that what you're proposing can actually be carried out in, in the real world. Sure. And then the last question for this break. I work with case studies and we have practical data which shows it impacts women and minorities. What kind of proposal would this qualify for? Um, I think found, yeah, you wouldn't be, basically you probably, it's not cut and dried again, I'm guessing you wouldn't be jumping into an efficacy study at that point. You'd want to be doing um, perhaps uh, design and development or um, I'm losing my place. I, I think that what that kind of data I think would be regarded as evidence of promise. So that is a good building block for moving forward. Okay. Thank you, Lori. So before we move on to Kirk, we have a brief commercial break. Uh, so here we go. Hi folks, have you ever found yourself wanting to get a way to get great content while connecting with others in the ATE program? We have the solution for you. Reading our social media feeds is a great way to spend time on a quiet Saturday afternoon and you can even share that with your ATE friends and family. Be the first to know about upcoming events on Facebook and Twitter. Find out about the resources we use every day on our Pinterest page and get to know the community through our LinkedIn group, which will also uh, in the future house our evaluator directory. Plus, our blog slices and dices important content generated by users from around the AT community. Bonus, it never gets dull. So go to our website today and check out what some have said is the best website Evaluate has made this year. All right, and I will return us to our regularly scheduled programming with Kirk, who will speak about research versus evaluation in ATE. Thank you, Kirk. You bet. Thank you, Jason, for that. I, I feel like I need to uh, go to the Evaluate TE site right now and check if there's been any interesting blog entries. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, my job today is going to be to try and unpack some of the details that we might uh, apply to thinking about the distinctions between research and evaluation in the context of ATE and NSF more broadly. And to do that, we're going to address three specific questions. Uh, first, how might these terms, research and evaluation, be framed uh, by concepts relating to the common guidelines? We think that there are some opportunities presented and we want to explore those. Second, how might the above question bear on ATE projects and other NSF supported work? This is undoubtedly going to be a, the beginning of a long conversation, but uh, we want to explore that. And finally, I hope that we will leave you caring a little bit more about this but uh, we want to address the question of why this is likely to matter to this audience. Let me give a very brief history here. This goes back uh, probably 12, 14 years ago when I started uh, doing evaluations in the NSF uh, sphere. We ran into something that I called the NSF conundrum. And it was a very complicated situation in actually working with NSF PIs and program officers. And, external evaluators because we weren't doing a very good job of separating the research functions from evaluation functions. Um, we found that very often the principal investigators, because they were the experts on what they were developing, tended to focus on the delivery of program activities. And one net result of this in a lot of cases is that the external evaluators, those of us brought in to, uh, to provide an external perspective, third-party third -party perspective on projects, 
sort of became de facto researchers. Um, this was problematic for a number of reasons, not least being that uh, it was really compromising the contributions to knowledge and um, research understandings. Now I'm going to perch very carefully on a word here that I used on the previous slide, that being innovation. Uh, this is a term that I've elected to use in conversations with folks. It, uh, I like it because it's, uh, it doesn't have the loaded uh, uh, affect that comes along with the word treatment or intervention because sometimes I think uh, that can be a little bit problematic. I also don't like the word program, even though we get called in to evaluate programs or projects because it doesn't have enough specificity to define the thing, the innovation, the, the, uh, the thing that's under development. Uh, and that's central to this whole idea that's brought to us by the common guidelines. Um, what the common guidelines do for us is give us the opportunity, and again, I'm careful here to say that I'm not redefining the, the NSF intellectual merit criteria, but it gives us an opportunity to translate this into ways that are applicable in NSF, in that the innovations ought to be conceived and improved and eventually adopted over that, that six step sort of life cycle that Lori talked about uh, to the point where ultimately they have value uh, to external, uh, to, uh, to education stakeholders. In the context of all this, intellectual merit is the contribution to the state of the art. It's the true research contribution. In this context, uh, the common guidelines give us an opportunity to think beyond the specific innovation and look at not only how we can improve it, but also look at how it's going to contribute to the broader understandings in education. So I'll do a little clear here. I have a suspicion that we aren't going to answer any final questions here about definitions of research and evaluation. But I'd be very interested to know what your personal definitions are. So again, using the chat window, please respond to these prompts. Number one, research is blank. And number two, evaluation is blank. And this may be different. They may be similar. They may overlap. But I'm curious to see in this audience what the perceptions are and what your personal definitions look like. Let's take just a couple minutes and see what we come up with. And no fair copying off of Lori just because she's running the conversation. Oh, interesting distinctions about the difference between re inquiry and making judgments, looking for data. Distinctions about the tools required to do research and the research itself. Here's a fairly extensive definition that looks at the distinction between general principles and assessing a particular innovation. That's pretty close, our friend Talbot. Okay, well, we'll let that spool along here, and it'll be interesting to go back and take a look at some of the additional definitions. But Let's see if we can't parse out some distinctions for the purposes of our conversation here today. And I want to be careful here to say that I'm not trying to define truth with a capital T here. We are not going to leave with universal definitions. What I hope to leave you with is one way to make the distinction between these two terms that is going to be helpful in the context of NSF, particularly ATE projects, excuse me, and in the context of the common guidelines. So what I'm going to do to make that happen is I'm going to add a few words. I'm going to try and be a little more precise with language usage here. 
sort of like the idea of innovation as, as a, a new term to try and help achieve some clarity. I'm going to go back to the distinctions made by the title of the Common Guidelines and reinforce that what we ought to be talking about in the context of these projects is research and development, or what I will call R&D. That's an extremely important distinction because what the Common Guidelines and that kind of approach allow us to do is reframe evaluation in this context as program evaluation. So let's talk about how to make that a little bit more clear with some additional definitions. Uh, research and development, as, uh, as Lori pointed out, is a structured study of the thing that I call the innovation, or what the Common Guidelines call the intervention. And ultimately, the questions that have to get answered are about its promise of effectiveness or ultimately its evidence of impact. Research and development happens internal to the project. The researcher or research team or researchers need to be working hand in hand directly with the folks that are doing the development of the innovation. Now by contrast, program evaluation is a different thing. It's looking at the implementation and impact of the project's research and development activity. So the work that the PI and his or her team proposed to NSF and the success of that work. Uh, with just a few exceptions, uh, and Lori pointed out a couple of those when she was talking about uh, external review, um, evaluation is typically assumed to be external to the project and bring a third party perspective to the show. I'm going to flash back here for just a second, quick review of the purposes that Lori talked about for research in the context of research and development. That in fact we ought to be iteratively improving the innovation, the, the thing, the intervention, and ultimately advancing broader understandings about education. The evaluation, the external program evaluation, ought to be asking very clearly, are those purposes being achieved? So it's the external evaluator or evaluation team or panel is going to be coming in and again looking at it from an external perspective to try and understand the degree to which the PI and her team have achieved their desired results. Now we could talk uh, probably at length about what the next external program evaluation in this context might look like. Um, Lori mentioned external feedback uh, and uh, specifically cited the possibility of using review panels or boards or a third party contracted evaluator. Um, but think about this in terms of some of the traditional ways that we've looked at the delivery of activities and the uh, success with which they are uh, implemented. Um, oftentimes we'll talk about an implementation impact kind of orientation where we measure the doing and we measure any kind of lasting results. Occasionally we'll have uh, uh, frame this as a process product kind of an idea. If in fact the development effort is going to produce actual deliverables, say a curriculum or a program or educational software for example, uh, one might look at the processes and the actual deliverables that come out of that kind of initiative. Sometimes this gets, gets called monitoring, and there is a certain amount of monitoring function to the annual performance reporting to NSF. Uh, but regardless, it's important that all of these processes, whichever one you might pick for a particular project, looks at both the research and the development activities, the functions that are baked into the work that's uh, being proposed and ultimately done for NSF. Now finally, Let's talk about this just briefly in the context of the ATE program because uh, it's slightly different uh, than is the case for some of the other program offerings National Science Foundation manages. Uh, if you look at your ATE uh, solicitation, which by the way is in force I believe through 2016, so we won't see any substantial changes there uh, for a few years. We've got three basic options under which we can propose. We've got ATE projects, we've got ATE centers, and we've got targeted research. Will's going to talk uh, at some length about targeted research because that's a very special sort of a, of a situation. But uh, it's interesting to look at the requirements of the various types of ATE projects that might be proposed because some of them, while they're very different one from another, 
Some of them are clearly within this research and development paradigm that Lori described as framed by the common guidelines. So for example, the, uh, the curriculum and materials development strand or, or uh, priority within the project option. Uh, if you go and look at that description, it literally uh, mirrors some of the language that Lori talked about for design and development research, that type 3 research as described in the uh, guidelines. Uh, ATE centers, interestingly, do not fall under the heading of something that's likely to fit nicely into the common guidelines for research and development kind of uh, frame because they're not about developing models. They're focusing on delivery of services. So they typically require something that's going to look much more like a traditional program evaluation looking at the quality and delivery of services and the results. So I do believe that is the extent of my contribution. I believe we're going back to Jason for the next steps. Okay, hello. Uh, well, thank you very much, Kirk. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, make sure that you type your questions and answers into the uh, chat box on the left-hand side. Uh, so it looks like we have a question here. What about program development? Where does that fall? And why is evaluation only external evaluation in this model? Yeah, and that's really central to trying to untangle the, the distinctions here. If you're talking about program development in the sense that you've found some kind of a need and you have an idea for a program that is not currently in existence, so you're going to create a new innovation, a new solution to a set of problems. Uh, that's very solidly in the center of this research and development kind of orientation. If you've got a pretty solid theoretical grounding and you're ready to uh, start developing a solution, then you're probably up at what Lori described as type 3 or design and development research. Uh, if you don't have all of the theoretical basis that you need in order to start the actual development of a solution, then you're more likely going to be operating down in levels one or type 1 and type 2 foundational or early stage exploratory research. Now to the second part of the question. This is really good, John. I appreciate you asking this question because I have defined my terms uh, in a slightly arbitrary way in the sense that if it is external to the program, then it is in my lingo, in quotes, program evaluation. That's, that's a function that I think NSF understands really needs to be external to the project team. So this is your advisory panel or your third party evaluator or your peers if you are publishing who are going to be judging the quality and the rigor of the research that you're doing. Um, if, if when you put external in, or when you put evaluation in your question, John, if you were thinking about assessing the innovation, the intervention, the thing being developed, then in Kirk's lingo here that I'm proposing we can use for untangling these questions, that becomes research and development. So again, R&D, research and development, is looking at the thing being developed and its promise or its impact. Evaluation is framed as program evaluation and is looking at the quality and the results that, with which the proposed activities are in fact uh, implemented. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so we have another question. What are the trainings that are offered out there that would qualify one as an evaluator? Boy, you know, you ask any professional evaluator what pathway led them to where they are, and you will get as many different answers as you will uh, as individual evaluators. Um, oddly, I actually personally went through a PhD program that was about education policy and evaluation, but a lot of folks get to uh, this kind of, uh, of, of position, this kind of trade in different, different fashions. There are university programs, there are graduate programs, and there's a lot of really good training offered through the American Evaluation Association, through uh, uh, resources like the Evaluation Research Center at ATE, Lori's operation, that can provide workshops and skills and, um, and the kind of understandings you need in order to do that, or help you to know how to find the right person to act in that role. 
Okay, excellent. Is there an advantage or disadvantage to including community professionals in the process from the beginning to the end of the project? Yeah, also another really good question. Um, when you say project, I'm going to presume that we're talking in the context of a uh, research and development project that might be funded uh, by an ATE grant. Um, I, th I think the short answer is probably yes. If uh, you're working in, for example, a particular uh, technical area, you're going to want folks that are working in that profession. You're going to want folks in the community that are hiring those technicians. You're going to want to have as many different perspectives represented as possible as you're developing your solution to, to the needs. Uh, pulling those people in can also help to clarify the needs that are being addressed. So it's a good example of something that might qualify as foundational or early stage research. Excellent. Uh, okay. So it seems like the model encourages project PIs and co-PIs to think of evaluation as something outside of what they do versus as something they do as internal evaluators. For example, evaluation as an add-on versus an integrated component. Um, perhaps you may comment on that? You bet. Um, I'm a huge advocate for external evaluators that maintain their third-party perspective by using good practices and uh, adhering to good professional standards. I think those people, though, ought to be uh, intimately involved and integrated with the project team so that uh, the resulting external evaluation is participatory. It's providing formative feedback as well as making judgments at the end of a project as to how successful it might have been. So I, I apologize, but it sounded like I was suggesting that the external evaluator needs to operate at some substantial physical or emotional or involvement distance. They just need to be able to maintain appropriate professional distance uh, in order to assure all the parties involved that you're getting a good unbiased view of implementation and impact of the evaluation of a uh, or the implementation of an ATE project or other NSF project. Okay, great. Well, thank you. And uh, so that will bring us to our second commercial break. Hi, folks. I'm here to tell you about an amazing resource that's right at your fingertips. The Evaluate website is chock full of informative information, including newsletters, blogs, and our resource library, full of uh, good resources for you to use. How can we maintain such a library, you ask? The answer is volumes. You can even find past recordings of our webinars on the website. Be the first one on your block to register for our family February 18, 2015 webinar on low-cost, high-impact evaluation for small projects. Plus, every visitor gets unlimited access to our free printable resources. So hurry on down and check us out. We now return to our regularly scheduled programming with Will, who will talk about ATE targeted research and technician education. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Jason. Um, I am the regularly scheduled program. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Evaluate for having me. Uh, this is a, uh, a partnership that developed from a conversation that I had with Lori at the uh, EPI meeting uh, not that long ago. So I'm very happy to be here to discuss targeted research and technician education and um, some of my research. I'm having, oh, here we go. There we go. All right. uh, there are two primary goals of the targeted research um, and technician education track. Uh, first, to stimulate and support research on technician education and to build a partnership capacity between two-year and four-year institutions uh, in order to design and conduct research and development, uh, as we were just talking about. In 2008, uh, AT held a targeted research design channel workshop in order to synthesize AT targeted research needs from the perspective of key stakeholders, such as researchers, AT PIs, business and industry, and NSF personnel. Uh, the white paper from this workshop presents challenges uh, that may discourage the pursuit of targeted research on student outcomes, uh, such as completion of evaluation and research, project longevity versus research interest, and the need for targeted research expertise. 
Um, I'll briefly discuss the first two, and most of my presentation will focus on the third. One quote stood out from the white paper. ATEPIs tend not to distinguish between evaluation and research and use these terms interchangeably. And this webinar, particularly uh, Kurt's section that we just heard, is part of efforts to distinguish research from evaluation and show the critical need for both in high impact research. With respect to the project longevity and research interest, uh, successful AC proposals are funded for uh, three to four years with clear NSF expectations to achieve a specific set of ambitious outcomes in that time period, as well as an indication of the long-term impact of the grant effort. Uh, the white paper um, may note that it is, and I'm quoting here, difficult to focus on general issues that extend beyond the life of an individual project. And another quote, longitudinal studies beyond the life of a project or center funding are generally not feasible. And one thing we know is that it's uh, often quite difficult to track community college students, uh, particularly um, yeah, after they have left the institution. So the key issue that I'm going to talk about today is the need for, for research expertise. Uh, AP centers and projects are typically led by educators and practitioners with expertise on program development, curricular development, and professional development within their area of technical expertise and technician education. Uh, research is not their focus, nor is it, is it in the mission of most community colleges. Uh, however, it is something that is increasingly necessary in order to get um, in order to get uh, funding uh, for the types of projects that we're discussing here. So when we discuss, um, in, you know, in doing my research uh, with the, my PATHEC team, I will discuss research with AT grantees and uh, other stakeholders and community college, industry, K-12, K-12 uh, education, we get the same revealing responses. Uh, NSF always wants to know about student outcomes, but we don't really know how to do the research. And uh, we didn't know there are people out there like you uh, who do this research. Um, coincidentally enough, uh, after this webinar, I'm actually heading to meet with a, uh, a colleague of mine who said this exact same thing uh, to me about it. ago. We're going to discuss uh, research collaborations uh, between USF and, and his community college. Now, the thing, the thing about this is that there's already a large community of social science and education scholars who conduct NSF-funded research in STEM education. And there's an even broader network of scholars who study education, life course transitions and trajectories, work and occupations, families, and other areas of research that would inform our understanding of community college student outcomes. Of course, the problem is few of these scholars actually have experience conducting research on community college STEM pathways or collaborating directly with community colleges, uh, specifically ASA, ASD programs. Uh, we tend to see um, folks who do uh, research in education, uh, when they look at community colleges, they're primarily looking at the transition from high school to community colleges and then transferring into four-year universities. So there is a tremendous opportunity uh, for community college-based PIs to develop partnerships with experienced social science and education researchers. So the targeted research program offers three funding tracks. The, um, the key thing to know when developing a proposed project must be a true partnership between two-year and four-year faculty, and two-year faculty must have leadership roles. The roles of both, both sets of faculty must be clear and guided by a specific purpose. Uh, for example, a university researcher should not simply be tacked onto um, an existing project um, in order to you know, provide some you know, small justification or small support for some type of innovation, uh, nor should a community college faculty um, be a token part of the project or merely there to help recruit community college students. So there needs to be a specific role. Now I'll throw out this question uh, to, to the group here, uh, and please answer this. 
for those of you at four-year institutions, what are some challenges that you have had in connecting with um, colleagues at two-year institutions? And for those of you at two-year institutions, what are some challenges you all have had in connecting with um, colleagues at four-year institutions? Okay, finding a responsive four-year person. I can definitely uh, understand that. Uh, I'm assuming uh, deep down Texas is Asian. Anybody else? Community colleges are seen as less valuable. Um, different goals, um, finding university researchers who do um, who view community college PI as equals, partnering designing a project where the cost is uh, not prohibitive. All right, these are all excellent challenges, and we can definitely talk more about these uh, specifically in the question and answer session. Uh, I'll outline here very briefly. Um, some strategies in my own personal experience uh, when we put together this proposal um, as a uh, sociology professor at a four-year institution, we specifically reached out uh, seeking a partnership with the Florida Advanced Technological Education Center, or FLATE, uh, which is conveniently located about 20 minutes from the USF campus. Uh, we reached out the basic idea of what we wanted to do based on the ATE solicitation. Uh, we met multiple times with uh, Marilyn and Richard, who I'm sure many of you know. Uh, we listened to their concerns, we asked our questions, we answered their questions, and developed research questions and a research agenda in response to their needs. Now if you're from a two-year institution and you're looking to connect with a four, someone from a four-year institution, the key is to look at build, the key to building partnerships is to identify experienced researchers uh, with focus on uh, their training in social science or education fields, uh, the interest in areas of research that are relevant to understanding community college student outcomes, and a track record of grantsmanship and or publications. Uh, for example, um, I have in my own qualifications, I have over 10 years of experience as an NSF grantee. I uh, moved up the ladder from a postdoc in my first job um, after earning my PhD, serving as a co-PI and now as a PI, I've, I've participated in several NSF review panels. Uh, in 2010, uh, published the book that you see there on engineering programs. So I'm going to give a brief, and I stress brief overview of my targeted research project. I'm more than happy to take more questions, and I have a booklet that will be available after the webinar that summarizes um, some additional findings through the third year of our project. Uh, now the project is Successful Academic and Employment Pathways in Advanced Technologies, or Path Tech for short. Uh, this was funded under a prior solicitation uh, which allowed grants for um, up to four years for over $1.2 million. And as you saw before, um, that, that level of funding is no longer available. Uh, so uh, the extent of this grant, um, it's not exactly, uh, not able to duplicate it, but um, there's aspects of this that would definitely translate to the new funding tracks. The objectives of the project are to provide a holistic understanding of pathways into engineering technology, or ET, uh, from, local, from local high schools and the workforce, and then pathways out of these programs into the local workforce. This project is a partnership between FLATE and USF in conjunction with four uh, Tampa Bay Area Community College ET programs. Our community college partners connect us with their students as well as high school ET programs and industry partners in their counties. Now a huge part of developing a successful partnership is being active uh, in the ET community, in the, uh, in the you know, broader manufacturing community. Uh, whenever Flate wants me to participate in a meeting 
or uh, give a talk to their advisory board, uh, I'm there. And uh, I, I joke somewhat jokingly <laughs> that I, I see, um, you know, folks from Flint and uh, other, other colleges, I see them more than I see a lot of my best friends. Um, I'm very active, and it's been an amazing last four years uh, being a part of this community and learning more about, um, about the colleges and about local industry. Through this partnership, uh, we developed a path tech model for conducting targeted research. Uh, the path tech model utilizes interdisciplinary frameworks and multiple methodolo methodologies with a focus on collecting and analyzing data from various sources and multiple structural levels. Our collaboration with FLATE and our shared partnership with schools, industry, and communities uh, is an innovative way to conduct social science research on technician workforce topics crucial to our society in order to move beyond instruction in academia and into classrooms, boardrooms, and local, state, and national policy. Now, at the heart of this uh, model is a commitment to pathways research. Uh, social science research has long noted that individuals transitioning into school and work often simultaneously experience other life transitions as well. Uh, furthermore, social class, race, ethnicity, gender, geography, um, and societal norms influence expectations for educational and occupational attainment. Uh, this space in which one's educational and occupational transitions meet life, life course transitions shaped by social and cultural forces can be broadly understood as pathways research. Studies that are limited to one dimension, such as training or job experience, uh, cannot fully examine the complex interactions between school, work, family, the economy, or the ways in which individuals are nested in each of these spheres throughout their lifetime. Now, I'll briefly describe the methodology that we use in the study, and, and this is from the qualitative portion of the study. We talked a, a little bit earlier, someone had a question about um, the extent to which uh, NSF values qualitative uh, research and quantitative research. Uh, this is a mixed method study, uh, but the qualitative portion of this project was more fruitful uh, due to some issues collecting, uh, being able to get uh, state data uh, from the Florida Department of Education that was crucial to the quantitative portion of the project. However, um, NSF has been very pleased with our qualitative work and, uh, and, and you, know, you know, very strong comments to our annual reports, and it's been very well received from the broader ATE community as well. Uh, we conducted interviews with high school students, teachers, and administrators, uh, community college students, faculty and administrators, and our industry partners. And we covered a variety of topics with each group um, through these open-ended interviews. And I'll just give you a, a chance to look at all of those areas that we covered with our interviews with high school students, community college students, and industry. So again, it's a brief overview of results from our community college interviews, um, looking at factors that in influence ET enrollment, uh, four types of ET students, pipeline versus cycling, and emerging pathways. First, students articulate life experiences that lead to pathways into um, ET. Uh, they discuss their inclination toward building things, fixing things, and using their hands. Some talk about how previous education, um, specifically their high school coursework and extracurricular opportunities led them into ET. Others mention their work experience, often in related fields, and how that um, propelled them to enroll in an ET program. Students also talk about information flows with respect to how they learn about technician education programs as well as what they know about the ET programs and uh, broader industry. They learn about ET programs through various channels uh, such as their um, friends, the web, recruiters, and this was especially uh, true of um, folks coming in from the military. The um, majority of students that we interviewed said they enrolled in ET because a friend or partner or coworker told them about it. So word of mouth is a key uh, factor here. Um, and from there, students uh, spent substantial amount of time doing research on the Internet to learn more about the courses offered and to learn more about uh, uh, engineering technology in general. Uh, students also talk about um, opportunities 
that they um, that they had to learn from their high school faculty, um, the role of instructors in promoting uh, them along this pathway. Um, however, while teachers and instructors, particularly in um, career academies or uh, you know, for, for some of these students, you know, long time ago were called VOTEC programs. Uh, that was a positive, but they also reported frustration with high school counselors' lack of knowledge about AS degree programs and technician education. A lot of students wish that they had learned about these opportunities sooner uh, in their postgraduate career careers, potentially encouraged to enter these programs uh, directly from high school. A good number of the folks that we interviewed in the community colleges were folks in their uh, late 20s to early 50s, and one of, the, one of the predominant themes we heard is, I wish I knew about this sooner. So much of the task um, for this project and further research and implementation, uh, design development, is to figure out ways to, in some respects, kind of time travel and get folks who enter into these programs in their 50s, how to get the next generation of folks that information much sooner. Um, fourth, students describe factors that motivated them to seek degrees uh, and credentials in ET. They talked about social mobility, higher pay, better jobs, uh, and possibility of uh, leading to a bachelor's degree in one day. And so, um, you know, these are all the, the, the basic motivations that we see that uh, the students we interviewed had. Uh, through this research, we were able to describe four types of ET students. AP students generally fit into one of four profiles, uh, learning, credentialing, reskilling, and empowering, although several participants share characteristics from multiple categories. Uh, the first group, the learning group, these are students who are developing interest in education through engineering technology. This group has a high school diploma or um, a GED. They enjoy working with their hands. They were indifferent towards schooling in the past. They tend to have a winding work history. Uh, but they found ET classes that were of great interest to them, and they're pursuing higher education uh, for most of them the first time. The second group is credentialing. Uh, they're credentialing in order to enter into engineering technology and related fields. Uh, they have a high school degree. They often have some college. Uh, they describe themselves as good students in the past but they were never exposed to engineering technology through school or through work. Uh, they tend to have a stable work history, and they're looking to get the credentials, the certifications necessary in order to enter into a desired field. The third group are specifically reskilling. Uh, this group is focusing on reskilling in order to improve their job situation. They've had careers in manufacturing or related fields. Uh, but they've been laid off after several years uh, of employment. So they're taking courses and seeking certification in order to get stable employment, and many of them specifically mention supporting their families as part of their motivation. The fourth group is empowering. And this group is degree seeking as self-empowerment. Uh, they're hoping to empower themselves and to gain respect of others, and they have a lifelong dream of earning a degree in higher education. Uh, one of the things that we're able to do with quality research is to, is to specifically zero in on, um, on specific groups. So specifically looking at women, for example, the majority of women that we interviewed put themselves into this category, specifically talking about um, how they can empower themselves through this degree, gain the respect of their male, male coworkers and peers. Overall, um, the community college programs have a transformative effect on students. Uh, these students were overwhelmingly optimistic about their experiences and had a, a very favorable impression of their programs. And um, so the more we learn about these students and the more that we you know, evaluate uh, and, and um, assess this data, the more we learn about how community colleges can continue to have this type of positive effect on their students and also how they can recruit more students who aren't in these programs but would be transformed by them as well. Another thing we, we learn is how students move their pathways through these programs. And uh, pathway models are especially important in the contemporary moment as fewer and fewer students experience a linear progression from school to work or a pipeline. 
and instead they experience cycling, which is a nonlinear uh, with multiple life transitions. Cycling is a fluid system of transitions between school, work, and family. In other words, a community college is not just a, de a destination with a simple entrance and exit. And the pathways between school and work, that kind of regular movement between school and work, is necess necessitated by broader market demands and personal life histories. So we find that individuals reskill by cycling between school and work in order to meet current economic demands for a highly skilled workforce that keeps up with changes and in innovations in technology. Uh, so through our research, we see these emerging pathways. Um, and our holistic examination of pathways within the Tampa Bay area reveals a variety of routes that individuals take to obtain an education, get and keep a job, and provide for families in order to grow and mature within a dynamic and evolving global economy. Uh, so understanding the confluence of these social forces gives leaders and policymakers the tools to support education and employment, improve the life chances and well-being of the citizenry, and foster progress as an educated and skilled nation. So now that we've uh, very briefly discussed um, my research, I want to end with an example of how to integrate um, the Path Tech research model or our research findings into the ongoing work of ATE centers and projects. Um, I actually just submitted a targeted research proposal uh, to follow up on Path Tech by developing a national survey of ET students based on these and other project findings. Uh, you know, through partnerships between Path Tech and ATE centers and projects, uh, such a survey uh, could be tailored to the specific needs of ATE projects in order to track student outcomes before, during, and after the scope of an ATE project. One potential framework for collaboration is that a college submitting an AT project proposal uh, seeking to conduct program development um, activities, for example, could partner uh, with our project. And we could administer a survey to students at the beginning of years one, two, and three in order to track trends or any changes in student outcomes. At the end of year two, um, we could partner in order to seek funding for a targeted research project that would allow for three more years of collaboration in order to track student outcomes beyond the duration of the original project. And so that's one way that um, you know, PIs could do small scale research um, in with a small project within the scope of an ATE project and then use that as a foundation for a broader targeted research plan. That would be one way to kind of double up effort. And so um, you know, potential for collaborations between current uh, two-year PIs uh, like the AT projects and four-year university researchers is, is there. And uh, I look forward to continuing this conversation about it. I look forward to your questions. Great. Thanks, Will. So it's time for our final QA break. Uh, so we've got some good questions and some spirited discussion here uh, in the chat box, so I'll just dive right in. <clears throat> so, so, pardon me. First, a question for Will. Are there any tips for convincing reviewers or convincing the NSF of the rigor of the qualitative research that you've done? Well, okay. This is kind of a unique, now I wouldn't say a unique situation, but I'll, I'll be very honest, the original, well, I guess this kind of happens a lot, the original project, you know, as it happened, uh, it developed very differently than what was anticipated uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, in this situation, the qualitative piece was kind of presented on the back end. And I'm kind of a unique person to be able to do this because I'm, I'm, my training is quantitative. However, my, my experience is working with qualitative uh, anthropologist. My department is heavily qualitative. Uh, my wife is even a highly trained qualitative researcher. So I've, I've gotten a lot of experience in kind of putting them both together. I think the things that you have to do when doing qualitative research is to, it, it helps for it to be a mixed methods approach. In other words, a qualitative and qualitative together in some form or fashion. Either uh, present in a way in which the qualitative uh, specifically informs the quantitative or the quantitative informs the qualitative. Uh, 
it is very true that reviewers are probably going to be more likely to have a quantitative background and more likely to understand quantitative research. So the qualitative has to fit with a quantitative agenda. I do think though that now that we have done this research and uh, my program officer understands some of the limitations that we've had with quantitative, um, NSF has been very pleased with what we've gotten with qualitative work and I think that the fact that the next step with this broader research agenda is to build a quantitative survey to make up for some of the gaps that we have in um, secondary data um, on AS degree programs, community colleges in general, I think that will help um, smooth the way for qualitative research going forward. Uh, right offhand, I can't think of any situations that I've been in a review panel where you know, a reviewer was like, ew, qualitative research, ew, no. Um, but I think there may be some just kind of inherent bias based on people's own experiences. Okay, great. So regarding the interview protocol, did you use standardized open-ended interviews or did you use an interview guide? We developed interview protocols, but um, our interviewers were instructed to you know, allow for open-ended discussion. Uh, we included prompts, uh, so you know, anybody could, you could you know, lead with the question and then as you know, people talked in depth about their experiences, our interviewers basically let them talk and ask questions that would allow them uh, to um, continue their free-flowing free, free flowing dialogue. Uh, one great advantage that I have, again, is I work with folks who have gotten a lot of training in doing interviews and doing qualitative research. So I didn't, I wasn't just bringing people off the street and saying interview. Um, everyone on the team had a lot of experience doing this, and so I was very fortunate. Okay. Uh, so then the next question that we have is, is there any idea how reviewers will be instructed to incorporate the guidelines into their proposal reviews since they don't replace the intellectual merit or broader impact criteria? I can't specifically speak to that because the only review panel that I have served on since the guidelines was directly after the guidelines. So there was no expectation that um, reviewers were, were that um, potential grantees were expected to specifically incorporate it. My impression is that intellectual merit and broader impact impact still still rule. Um, and yeah, I doubt that will be any different. I think that as we continue to figure out uh, what the guidelines mean um, and what can be done within the guidelines, um, I think reviewers will start to include that more or at least expect that people have reviewed the guidelines and that's apparent in the proposals. Um, and I would, I would say that the changes to the, the ATE funding, the targeted research funding structure may be a specific, maybe it may have been specifically to encourage uh, to refer to the guidelines uh, for this research. So I, I, was, I will say though, targeted research is very much open to all six stages of, of, of research. And from what I've seen, all six types have been submitted, even if it was before they were specifically labeled as such in the guidelines. So. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't let the type of research discourage me from doing, from submitting it to AT as a targeted research project. Sure. Um, also, uh, now that you have worked on ATE research, uh, working with community college students, what advice would you give to another researcher in developing a proposal? Well, if I was, if I was advising a fellow sociologist of education background and doing what I do, um, I would, the first thing I would say is to build the partnership first. You know, do what I did, go on with a basic idea of what you want to do, but 
you know, if you have a college in mind, if there's somebody that you specifically want to work with because of the strength of their program, their unique location, uh, you want to, you know, some people want to work with, you know, very in schools, very rural schools, whatever. Build the partnership first. You know, set up some type of meeting, express interest. Um, I was, uh, I was in a, a meeting. I'm on a, I'm on several advisory boards, but uh, I was on an advisory board with some colleagues of mine at a four-year institution who are trying to develop uh, partnerships with community college. And I was saying, look, you got to understand that. You can't just go in and say we want to work with you, and that's going to be sufficient. Because you know everybody I know who works at community college is extremely busy, and so you have to make sure that what you're doing is of specific value to the college, and that you can make that clear that this is how my research will benefit uh, your program. This is how my research, this is how our research will benefit your institution, and this is the value that I see that you add as a um, Community college faculty, uh, you know, to this project. Um, I guess in terms of uh, any other advice I would give, I think really that's the main thing. I think if you if you find an experienced researcher, once the relationship is built, the research agenda should just it should just happen on its own, really, because you know I have a very simple understanding of what research is: is asking questions and answering them. And if you find the right researcher, they will develop the defensible methods, a coherent uh, research strategy that will be inclusive and that will, that will lead to um, kind of broader understanding with potential for uh, you know, further development and implementation. Okay, thank you. And then our final question, which um, we can look at, is in the study that you mentioned, did you tabulate the percentage of students participating in the study plan on continuing to academics and those that planned on entering the workforce after graduation? Yes, but I don't have the information on me right now. Okay. Well, thank you. So there was one final comment that uh, in the box here uh, describing about describing the uh, uniqueness of the um, ATE program. Uh, so, oh, I'm sorry, I just saw Elaine Kraft had one other question. How about the other way around? What would sell you as a researcher to work with a community college seeking to engage in research? So if you could um, briefly comment on that, and then when we go to the feedback, Lori will wrap up on the uniqueness of the ATE program. Sure. Um, what would sell me? Um, first of all, um, the what's unique about a, um, a potential a college, about a potential collaborator? Um, you know what are the issues that they're dealing with? Um, how does you know how could the research benefit the college, but also how would it appeal to kind of my interest as a sociologist? What are the unique issues that um, students at that college, people in that community face? Is it a you know a down on its luck community that depends on the college to you know educate people and bring people? Uh, kind of uplift the citizenry. Um, you know, those types of issues are very interesting to me. Those types of stories are very interesting to people in my field. Um, also, uh, just the the personalities involved. For example, the person I'm meeting with in 45 minutes, <laughs> actually, um, you know, he's a very uh, dynamic personality. I've I've met with him before, different meetings we've met one-on-one um, -on -one several times. And he and I, when we sit down, we just come up with ideas. And so developing that type of relationship is key. Um, I knew early on from meeting with uh, Marilyn and Richard that these are people I genuinely liked and that I was a big fan of their work. And so, you know, anybody from the colleges who is looking to work with me, I mean, that's something that I would, um, that I would find very attractive, is to, you know, dynamic personalities. And thankfully, Pretty much all the folks that I've met uh, through ATE are dynamic personalities because that's really what it takes um, to to sell and promote uh, these programs. And so, you know, I'm you know I, I really can't think of any situation in which I would personally turn down an opportunity to work with folks. Okay. Well, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, 
So we'll be posting the feedback uh, survey link momentarily. Uh, so um, and you'll see it's about to pop up on the screen. We uh, would like to invite you to take that survey. We, uh, you know, it's no surprise to us that evaluation is pretty important here. Uh, so we'd like your feedback on the webinar as well as your idea about topics that you'd like us uh, to address in future webinars. So you'll see there on the screen the survey just popped up. Um, it will take you about a minute or two to complete. We'll leave the survey open, but moderators, remember not to close the survey window on your screen because uh, that will shut it off for everybody. While you all are working on that, um, I'd like to turn it briefly over to Lori to make a uh, discussion about what is unique about the ATE program. Am I off mute, Jason? Yes. Okay, so just real quickly because we are at closing time, I just want to remind folks that the ATE program was established by a congressional mandate. Uh, that I think it was 1992. So it's a little different than NSF programs. Um, the Congress charged NSF to develop a program that would improve the quantity and quality of uh, the technical workforce in the United States working through two-year colleges. So they have a mandate to develop and implement programs, which is a little bit different than NSF programs. So I just wanted to point out that nuance before we close. But thank you um, to everybody and our guests for donors and Jason. And so please do our survey and have a great day. All right, thank you for joining us, everyone, and take care. Have a great day. And for those of you that will be going on winter break, happy winter break.